Okay, I'm, I'm really delighted to be here, and I, I, uh, I, I thank both conveners and others uh, for the chance to speak. Um, if my <laughs> computer will work, yes, please. Okay, um, and uh, I am going to try to put you know, a face and a body on some of the uh, humans that are part of the story, because what's striking uh, is uh, how, how bad the terrestrial record is for the Sahara, because whenever you go out and work, and I think that uh, Stefan gave a good idea of what it's like to be in the Sahara. It's my favorite place in the world, but it is um, a challenging place to work, and it ends up uh, deflating most of the evidence that exists uh, in these ephemeral environments. And so. It's surprising how little we know about the actual people. And so I was, uh, you know, I'm going to be speaking about work on a place I call Gobro. It's in central Niger. And uh, it, it's work that was done by a large group of people. And, um, you know, the team uh, is, uh, involves uh, first uh, sort of an Italian subgroup, uh, Elena Garcia. Uh, I originally brought to Gobro. Um, and she brought some colleagues from Italy, and then I've assembled um, a larger group of some French, some American, uh, and uh, colleagues from Germany and, and England and elsewhere uh, to try to understand Gobro. I will admit at the beginning that there was a difference of opinion on what I'm going to present today, and Elena has presented an idea that I think might be, might be regarded as more traditional. We've already heard some references to it. That the later people in this area are pastoralists. And I never saw the evidence for that. I still don't. I don't believe there's hardly any evidence for that whatsoever. And that's actually, as Stefan was pointing out, is a very interesting thing, that people do not necessarily need to uh, start producing food if, as Sutton proposed back in 1977, they live in an environment that is providing uh, enough hunting and gathering to subsist. And ironically, the, uh, the, the greened Sahara seemed to have provide, provided that over a long period of time and over a, a large geographic area. And so I'm not going to mention most of these people, but um, they are responsible for a lot of this work. The dating work was done by the late Jean-Francois Saliège, and now by his protege, uh, Antoine Zazo. There's uh, a lot of other work on lithics and also uh, Elise Dufour on otoliths and strontium isotopes and all sorts of other things. I didn't go there to find humans. I normally work on archosaurs in the Mesozoic. It's one of the great um, hunting grounds for these kinds of animals. So I found uh, you know, 80 to 100 tons of, of this kind of material and have gotten good at excavating it, preparing it, studying it with the modern tools of paleontology, which often involve now cat scanning and reproducing things. and you know, uh, assembling uh, very fragile items, uh, sometimes large, sometimes small. We go and CAT scan things. This is the endocast from a dinosaur so that we can understand the internal ear structure and the posture of the animal and so on. This, like Stefan, requires the ability to put up with uh, temperatures and other kinds of conditions. I won't show burning trucks. I, we were stuck up once in the desert, survived that rather well. Um, and the last time I was in Niger, and I've worked all over the Sahara, I had an armed guard of 40, which I regard as a good way to contribute to the local economy. And you bring teams that can withstand these kinds of conditions. And so there's a lot of people who are now young professors uh, on this team that collected some 20 tons of material. Well, one day, uh, I and, and the sites in Niger, just to uh, say one last thing, have been known for a while, archaeological sites, not paleontological, but archaeological, have been known for some time. In fact, it's been the French uh, focus for a number of years in the in Francophone countries and especially in Niger. But it led to a question by someone who actually reviewed all the archaeological evidence of the Sahara and Hur in a paper and said, where are the people? <laughs> you know, for stretches of thousands of years, there's evidences of all the artifacts deflated. Where are the people that were living there in supposedly uh, such great numbers? And I chanced on a site that had a lot of these people, hundreds of them, buried in a place that nobody thought they would look. They didn't think to look there because normally uh, the attitude of an archaeologist probably has a parallel in the paleontological world, is to look around refugia. Refugia, places where people would, 
would hide in times of duress the, the uh, higher places or places perhaps that had water. But one place uh, that uh, was not looked at was the heart of the Tenere Desert, a peneplain of Cretaceous rock, that flat area subject to winds and generating much of the dust that uh, some people are coring on the side of the uh, Atlantic. Why would anything be preserved here? It was, in fact, an area of great deflation, an area where you could look at the basement rock, the, the Cretaceous, for dinosaurs. Well, on the left there, that little elevated structure is a structure of paleodune sand held by what I've come to learn are calcretes and rhizoconcretions by the geologists who really brought meaning to, to especially the second term, rhizoconcretions. And in the middle, also, another structure. And these structures are Pleistocene and Holocene in age. And they house hundreds of human burials. And the area around, in front, a lake bed, a paleo lake deposit, and then a short distance in the back, a gap of 110 million years, and in fact, you can find dinosaurs and super crocs and things like that. In fact, I'm waiting for the time that we find a human artifact made from one of these bones, because clearly, they were available to these Holocene inhabitants. So, I wasn't expecting to find this. I actually went to Peter's alma mater and earned a geology degree uh, there, so that was uh, helpful in this quest. I also then went to the University of Chicago and taught 12 years of medical human anatomy, so I'm familiar with the human anatomy. And that is what was scarce in the Sahara, but abundant at this site. And so we found the largest, uh, oldest graveyard in the Sahara. We'll talk about that. There's an enduring mystery at the site. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about it. For anybody that collects things and any ar archaeologist, when you can collect 100 human skeletons and find them right next to each other, and they are as much as 5,000 years apart, and you have one disturbed burial, one burial that pushed somebody else out of the way and no more, you don't have a mayhem of bones. Uh, how this happened with the density of burials that we have at that site is going to be probably the enduring mystery of, of Gobro. It's a fantastic thing that, that uh, is, is hard to explain. The only site with a 5,000 year span of burials where you really have habitation, you have garbage piles, uh, middens, and other kinds of evidence of habitation for 5,000 years. That's, that's equivalent to the span from the time that civilization, you know, history began and, and the building of the pyramids to, to today, just to, you know, put it in perspective. The best chronology, just because it is hard to date humans in the Sahara, hard to date them because of radiation and heat, destroys collagen. So you can't use normal sea dating. You have to use bioappetite dating, and that's where Francois, Jean-Francois Saliège and Antoine Zazo came in. They were at the forefront of dating bioappetite in the bone uh, matrix and especially in the enamel of teeth, and we use that extensively at this site. Uh, window into funerary practices, bar none. It's going to give you, and I think you'll agree, uh, an interesting look at these people. And double and triple burials, uh, things we weren't uh, ever expecting. So first I'm gonna look briefly at the geologic setting. Uh, Gobro, again, is in central Niger. Um, it is uh, an area of several paleodune sites. So these are those uh, oval sand-colored sites uh, that accumulated at the end of the Pleistocene and the early part of the Holocene and were surrounded by a relatively small lake. What I didn't realize was so attractive about this area, because you have to ask, what is so attractive about this area? It's not a cliff-dwelling area where people can... What was attractive is that there is a rare fault, geologic fault, a small one by geology standards, called the Mazalet Fault, but marked on geologic maps, a vertical fault uh, nearby that created a fault-bounded lake. Now, it's come to some attention of people studying human evolution that fault-bounded lakes are really tied up with human ancestry in a, in, in a good bond because water goes up to the fault, 
the edge of the cliff and turns a waterfall, preventing uh, the lake from expanding infinitely like it was in a bowl. It puts a control on the lake margin, and that's why people like it. And I think that was why Goberl was such a popular area for so long. It was a fault-bounded lake and a rare fault in the, in the Tenere. It is uh, possible to dig through <laughs> the deepest part of this record. I took, you know, it's not very indurated, so one takes one's life into one's hands, but I did go down the three or four meters until I hit rock bottom, Cretaceous rock, and then take some OSL samples, try and verify the age of the first sand that accumulated in this area. And uh, the, the burials are all located in the upper meter. We tried to prove that. This is what the lake bed looks like. There was a Paleo Lake Gobero that surrounded this area, this popular beach resort during the Holocene. And it was teeming with all sorts of animals. Virtually almost any animal that you know from the Serengeti was there. And we have a, a great record of it, sometimes entire skulls or skeletons. We're talking about, from, I'm not going to talk about the fauna in detail, but we're talking about elephants, hippos, crocodiles, frogs, everything that would be in a, uh, a savanna, wet savanna environment. Now, what is holding this site from total destruction and deflation, as is the case in all the surrounding territory, minus a few other pockets, is what uh, Felix Henningsen has called, Peter Felix Henningsen, geologist, has called swamp ore. And Calcrete. Well, if you look down, you'll see a calvarium, a human skull filled literally with the calcrete. It's solidly cemented into this, and that forms what looks like almost an atoll around the habitation area and the burial area. It's clear from the thousands of artifacts and the millions of pieces of debitage that Gobero, and I'm not going to say a lot about this for archaeological details, was not just a funerary site. It was a habitation site. They lived there. They made their tools there. And they buried their dead there at times in the past. And so you see calcrete examples. And you can see the roots growing down into this. That was underwater when that was forming. And over here, especially the swamp bore, again, produced by uh, the oxygen conditions of roots of reeds. You're looking at water level that would have been about a meter higher than that rock when it was formed. This is what the fault looks like. These are dinosaur rocks, of course, because the Cretaceous is swept up by this little fault. You can find some of the rock engravings from very late times um, of the populations, the Maghrebi populations that uh, the, the last speaker, Laura, talked about. Uh, but basic, because there are people that uh, continue to live in this area despite the desiccation. But we're going to talk about the people that lived here when it was a more verdant place. And so, this is, again, what it looks like. And here's an exaggerated cross-section. And so it goes right through those two sites, the sites on the, on the left of this diagram. You see the Cretaceous, the green rock coming up. Uh, there's a certain amount of recent dune that, that uh, covers certain areas, and it migrates. There's Barkan dunes on the backside. Uh, but what has held this for the last uh, 10,000 years is, and it's deflating, is that calcrete and, and the rhizoconcretions. The people who are living on top at times, reeds surrounded this area, literally cemented in uh, a periphery that has held, held these sites. Now, it wouldn't take much to inundate the site. You see, the sites are quite low, three meters or so, uh, of paleodune sand. Uh, once, you, once you fill uh, water beyond about three meters in depth, so pretty shallow, 10 feet, three meters, those people, their graves, their living sites are covered. And we know this happened because long periods of inundation produce a color on the fossil that's very, on the fossil human bones and faunal bones that's pretty characteristic, a pyrolusite staining. Up at about 15 meters, you're getting close to one of the low points in the fault, the breaking point where water would go away and people would maybe move to the margins but not have to move that far. So that's Gobero. And my goal was not to lose any information and to gather as much information as possible, everything I possibly could. And so I took standard archaeological protocol and learned it, but then added from my own field when I felt we would do a better job. And so for mapping, we laser scanned the surface. 
We sure started using total stations, but it's hard to find anything that's permanent out there. We, for, for example, could not find <laughs> the French uh, anchor point for the topographic map, even though they had it marked. And so we couldn't find uh, sometimes our, our, our corner stakes uh, put in metal rods uh, the following year. So we ultimately brought a laser scanner out there and literally laser scanned the entire surface of Gobro and the Fossil Lake. This is actually a composite balloon photograph that we took from a helium balloon. We've covered the entire area photogra photogrammatically as well. And so we can really locate where virtually everything is down to uh, a centimeter or two. Very grossly, we're looking at two populations of humans buried at that site. The earlier population, uh, I'm going to call Kithians following Desmond Clark. Desmond Clark did work about 300 miles north of here, near the Ayer, in a site called Adrarbus. It was just published by his students and acolytes, posthumously, the Kiffians and the Tenoreans, uh, the subsequent population. Now, these were cultural terms more than physical terms, because basically the remains of humans were basically not found. And secondly, a lot of the cultural terms were based on composite ideas, really. I mean, because most of, the, most of the artifacts, almost all the artifacts, were deflated. And so they were just sort of assuming things. And so this is sort of what the history and brief geology history of Gobro looks like um, when we diagram it out uh, thanks to the geologists and us arguing. And there's going to be some complexities, because we have more calcretes uh, to date. and uh, and ore deposits, but this is sort of the G overall picture. So back at about 15,000 years or so, we see the accumulation of these uh, dune sands. That's the OSL date we get right from the bottom. It, it, we, we got several OSL dates, blindly gave them to the laboratory. They oriented them all in the right, right order that we found them. And so I sort of think the 15,000 date is, is fairly believable, 16,000 BP for the bottom. It accumulated, accumulated up against the fault here. At some point, um, Water came into the picture um, in the early part of the Kiffian period. Now, there could have been a time, we're going to see that what we just talked about, a delay from the time that uh, people here are telling me the weather changed to much, much wetter conditions. I don't know how to explain that, except that it doesn't take too much water to make Gobro unlivable. So maybe it was high water at 11,000 or 10,000 BP that prevented humans from living in Gobro. I, I don't know, but I can tell you so there may be a high water phase here. I can tell you that uh, people came to live on Gobro by about 10,000, a little bit younger, about 9,700 BP, there were people there. And they were an interesting people. They buried themselves there and lived there. And then water rose and covered them for a good length of time. Uh, it could be right at the uh, 8.2 mark, there might be uh, more fluctuations, but clearly by about 8.2, they were buried underwater. We find no evidence of humans or any other animals datable in place past 8.2. That would correspond well with what we've seen. And then it dried out. And this, again, corresponds in general to uh, a time period. We, we, we don't date anything to this time period. There's one mollusk shell that we date to this time period when it dried out. Then eventually the water came back. And a different kind, in this case, uh, the pyrolusate st staining makes it easy to identify most of the earlier skeletons. They're dark. They're almost black. A new kind of person moved in, or persons, maybe introgressed slightly with the previous population, but very distinctive uh, in skull form. And about as distinctive as you'd get in any homo sapien population worldwide, far more distinctive than even the settler versus the Native American. I'll show you some of the differences between these people. Uh, and eventually, um, we end up with a, uh, a desiccation a little bit um, after uh, the end of the African human period as normally defined. Uh, and people still live in the area. We find them as transients past 4.5 BP. So that's, that's the overall, that's the overall, and the thing I'm going to point out is that these people <laughs> are living and literally depositing themselves in the same burial ground at the same level. There's no statistical difference. You can walk three feet and find someone who's you know, 3,000 years younger. It's rather staggering. OK, so here's the chronology. Uh, and I haven't plotted all the latest dates up, but we've dated a small number of paleoic sediments, mollusks, ceramics, temper in the ceramics, enamel, bone, <coughs> fauna, sometimes harpoons, stuck in the lake sediment. We dated those. 
and we came up with some interesting results. I mean, basically we see uh, these two sort of uh, habitation phases and then a third habitation phase here, or fourth if you count uh, <clears throat> a late Pleistocene, early Holocene time period here as uh, one. There's epipaleolithic tools that we find deflated in the area. Um, but there's two main uh, humid period occupations. And here's the humans dating, these are the radiometric dates taken from enamel, mainly and bone. In this case, tooth bone and enamel all consistent. Uh, these are the consistent measurements from individuals. And this is the, the, the second uh, duration of, of, of longer period. What we're going to do is going to look at sort of this first um, phase here. We've dated fauna and some other things to this phase. This is your classic um, aqualithic, if you will, uh, uh, Ibero-Marusian population. Not, sorry, not depicted here. That's, that's a, uh, this individual. Um, there's classic dotted wavy line ceramics dated to this area. Uh, there's uh, a lot of uh, fauna from hunter-gatherers and classic. There's also a, a very dense area uh, of burials that clearly would be uh, argued to be a cemetery because we've actually now completely excavated this area. This is two meters here to show you how dense it is. Um, and there's several more burials there. None are disturbed. They all date to about 250 years back, 9,700, 600 years ago. So it's a very dense and, and clearly uh, they, uh, this shows you some of the excavations to how close some of these are. Sometimes they have similar orientations. We couldn't find any overall. They have a very similar burial style, we'll come to see. So I think this is uh, a burial cemetery. And uh, here's uh, two individuals, uh, a double burial of two children, four and five years old. They're not the same age. Uh, but a, again, a very hyperflex kind of burial that characterizes this time period. Here's an individual. We called her uh, Zena because, in fact, she was shot with uh, some kind of arrowhead. This is actually pretty rare in the archaeological record. The lithic splintered in the bone. We tried to actually CAT scan it, print it, and put it together again. But this is pretty characteristic upon impact on, on, uh, on uh, a, uh, a vitric lithic. Uh, and the person survived. The bone grew over. In fact, we never found at Gober on the 100 burials we excavated anybody with a crushed skull or an arrowhead in their back, much in the way of uh, the Iceman or anything else. Um, these people from the early phase have very long skulls. They have an occipital bun. You'll notice the width of the skull here. This is a child. I mean, it almost looks hydrocephalic when you're looking at the child. Um, they have square orbits. They have, uh, they're not very prognathous. They have a pentagonal outline on the back of the skull. They're very distinctive. And when you, when you look at the skulls um, and the occipital, uh, the, the frame of magnet is located well under the occipital bun in the back. And they're very long skulls inside you, very distinctive. And uh, when you plot them out on a PC component, as, as Chris Dojanowski did, the skeletal biologist uh, on the team, um, you find them, this group here, of skulls from that time period, plotting closely to the ibero marusian population. So it's a population, as the previous speaker pointed out, the desert was very large prior to this time, pushing people to the very margins, Algeria, Morocco, Tifalalt places like that, cave deposits, dating back to almost Cro-Magnon times, 25,000 years ago, 20,000, 15, 17,000. This is uh, the people, and also uh, on the Iberian Peninsula and in southern Italy. Is this uh, the Intu population that the previous speaker uh, spoke of? Could be. They look very robust. They are very tall. Uh, this individual gave us um, some reason to try and figure out how tall they actually were. Uh, there's a cottage industry in stature. You measure a few long bones, you put it into a formula, but there's a better way if you can measure the entire stature forming part of the skeleton of a human and add a soft anatomy factor. And so we, we, we did that. We, we applied it to the skeleton digitally, and we calculated the stature. It hadn't been done before. So uh, the stature of this individual in, in uh, American terms, six foot two, uh, really about two meters, very tall, very robust. Uh, and we went further just to make him stand again for fun. Uh, but also to, you know, anybody can get this file and take a look at the morphology of the bones of the, uh, of the individual. We did disarticulate some. But in fact, the pose of this individual is remarkable. Uh, the hands are flexed over its mouth. 
Uh, it is bundled within 10 inches, or I guess that would be about 20 centimeters, 22 centimeters. It had to have been bundled. The feet are crossed. We found the position of every single bone. And I didn't know what was under it or what was not under it. So I wanted to collect it to find that in the laboratory. It would turn out there was some shards underneath the skeleton, and I know exactly where they are. So we could give somebody, an archaeologist or a human skeletal biologist, the morphology of this person, but still take him back intact. He's one of our oldest individuals, uh, completely intact, so we can understand the burial position, which was very interesting. We would not, all you need to do is compare the drawings that we made in the field, which is what we would have standardly been left with, with what we actually know about this human now afterwards. Um, and dotted wavy line and thick, uh, thick ceramics like this date to this area, and of course harpoons date to this area as expected. We have quite a few harpoons. They made them from two sources. We've sectioned them They're using crocodile bone as well as mammal bone. And we did find very few, but we did find microliths and some arrow points uh, in some of the graves of these animals. Dating back to this period and found in their garbage piles is everything under the sun. Uh, of course, lattes, the perch, and an assortment of fish, but also heart of beast, uh, a number of different kinds of, uh, of bovids uh, and uh, uh, other kinds of animals, including hippo. When we move to the, now there's nothing found in this zone here except uh, a, a single mollusk that likes sort of periodic uh, water uh, habitats. And then we uh, have dates from a wide variety of things from the second occupation phase. Now, they're called tenorans and are named after this disc, which has, sadly, never been found in place yet. It, it's missing a chip here. Actually, it's a circular thing, an oval thing, very thin, very difficult to make, and made out of a really interesting rock that I ended up identifying and differing from the previous. It's actually a felsite. It doesn't have quartz in it. It's a microcrystalline rock. And we found out where they got it from, because no one knew that either. Not far, as you might suspect. This is what they look like. This is one of the earliest skulls from this time period. They're much taller. They much, look much more ultimately like our skulls. And if you compare them, and I knew we could, we would get different shaped brains out of them. It doesn't have a huge meaning. Um, but in fact, the endocasts, which you can see here digitally recreated and printed, look quite different from uh, an early uh, Holocene uh, human versus uh, the later Holocene human. And they buried their people immediately with things. So this individual that I was showing you the first uh, picture of, the skull, was buried, in fact, in almost like a fetal-like pose. So it looks somewhat like the earlier burials. He's, he's completely wrapped up. And on his underside, the most amazing thing, a turtle carapace. So his pardon me, his derriere, <laughs> was placed inside a carapace, and it was so tightly oppressed to his skeleton that his hip bones actually made this, uh, this bulge. Uh, there was no other postcrania. I think this is prima facie evidence that they were put in animal sacs uh, to actually contain the fossil so close to the skeleton, but it is a testimony also to the way that we collected it because we were completely destroyed it. We lifted the bones up out of the ground. Uh, as it were. So now we can take the skeleton back, and we have, and we can look at it. We can, uh, you know, uh, look at exactly the position of the turtle carapace, which you're seeing coming around here uh, on the backside here, and look at the position. It is like a pretzel. It's hard to understand. You really have to study it. Uh, and so, but the Tenorians did this with regularity. Uh, here's a man with his head buried in a semi-pot, and over his head was the, I, I've studied this, the ankle of a crocodile. It's amazing, and over his ribcage, and he had burn marks on him. These people really were doing lots of different things with, symbolically with their burials than the earlier people, and this is what the pot looks like reconstructed. It has a very unusual pattern under, under his head, and, but he's now buried on his side, and this is what the later people did. They buried children like this on their side. And here, in this 10-year-old, a reason I to collect this intact is the first upper arm ornament. We didn't know what it was. It was almost ready to break apart when we brushed the sand off of it. It's hippo ivory, made from a giant hippo canine. And um, an upper arm bracelet, you'd never figure out that a person was wearing it there. Uh, just rather amazing. Uh, and hippo ivory was one of the things that they used in abundance. So, Here's 
the most artistic element ever from the Holocene of Africa. It's just an absolutely gorgeous pendant. Uh, it was found along with these beads. These are hippo-ivory beads. Here's an amphibolite. Here's a, 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 a metamorphic rock from the Ayer somewhere. Rodent problems. There's a rodent that took a chunk out of this one. Here's the enamel on the classic hippo ivory. Uh, when you look at the pendant, uh, it has a pattern on both sides, a bird foot pattern made by somebody that was right-handed. You can see it was worn centrally by the, by the, by the pendant mark there. This is a, an elegant and absolutely beautiful piece uh, that takes the cake for one of the most beautiful pieces ever produced. Um, this is my reconstruction of it. We don't there's ostrich eggshell beads in the center of separating some of these beads, but we don't have more than just um, a, an educated guess as to what it would have looked like in life. Other burials, here is pollen uh, from a holly-like plant, a plant that could only have come from the top of the air under her head and under her feet. Never found before at a site like that, not found in the general pollen samples from the site. And then a burial that was, I knew, extraordinary even from the time that I saw it eroding from the ground. Three crania, too close for comfort, in fact, part of the same burial. It was a triple burial of a five-year-old, an eight-year-old, and a 30-some-year-old woman. And artifacts found in different places. Uh, four unshot, unhafted arrowheads, never been used, with, with children and, 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 and a woman. A very unusual combination. Uh, we found it several times at the site, and it really is one of the most interesting um, grave goods that we find at the site associated with women and children. Um, but half of those artifacts were under the skeleton. I didn't know that until, for example, this one, right between the radius and ulna. I didn't know that until we found it in the lab. But how to collect something like this, it really is quite a challenge. So what you want to do is you want to take your samples first for pollen or anything else. And then you can use standard laboratory hardener to harden it enough to take it and do the rest of the preparation in the lab. And then you get something like this. It's challenging, but then you get something like this. So this is the triple burial seen in all its glory, top side. This is the triple burial seen in all its glory, bottom side, including the artifacts that were underneath it. And the fact, we didn't see this in the field at all, that the woman had her hands crossed in a very symbolic way, intergaging the hands of the eight-year-old in between. We have sectioned the molars of the eight-year-old and the five-year-old. Uh, there is dental evidence that they're related. We know how old they are in terms of days. They don't have a similar stress history. This age range buried suddenly is remarkable. I think it was an accident. The best I can understand is that it was a drowning in the, in the nearby lake. We know this, uh, this skeleton now from three dimensions and can twist it around and look at anything you want. See how thin it is. It's, of course, collapsed in the sand sand burial. Um, we can also um, relish the fact that our sampling pollen, just for, for good measure, produced pollen clusters. And so this is the likelihood uh, a floral structure to get that much pollen. Many clusters of pollen of the same species, a celosia type plant that would look like this, were laid down underneath the skeletons because they were found uh, by our palynologists under the skeleton. So an amazing burial. Uh, many artifacts date to this period from the burials. There's uh, Amazonite, we'll return to that. Um, the middens uh, show, this one we collected intact and prepared it. Someone was, had collected clams from the nearby lake and was actually shelling them and stacking the shells. Uh, some of the fauna was found articulated like the snake or this complete turtle on top of the site. It was taken there by humans, it had to have been, it was right on, on top of the site. What was conspicuously absent, conspicuously absent compared to Jarbus, were domesticated animals. We literally had three or four specimens of Bos taurus, this being by far the most complete, a deflated mandible, which we dated twice to the Tenorean period. They must have known about cattle. 300 miles, <clears throat> 500 kilometers to the north was a site dominated by hundreds of cow bones. There were pastoralists there without doubt. They met in the Ayer to make the engravings that are so famous. Surely they must have, must have known about cattle pastoralism. And that's what makes the site, I think, particularly, particularly interesting to see a people living contemporaneously with pastoralists within a stone's throw of them, both accessing the same felsite quarries and yet 
no prevalence of pastoral at this site. Perhaps it was just visited. We'll, we'll try, you know, periodically. Is that why they're missing? And they were actually pastoralists, and this is their vacation home? Uh, I, I, I tried to answer that question. You know, the, one of the ways you can sort of answer a question of what they were eating is to look at the plaque, the dental calculus, on some of the skulls that date to this time period. We didn't find any domesticated grain. Half of it was grasses, um, fruit, evidence of eating fruit, wild fruit. Um, we found in the same midden sometimes multiple patterns. This upset the ceramists because they're not supposed to be together, but we found them together, dated them, dated the temper as coming out the same. So I, I, you know, well, I just have to try and go with where the evidence points. The Amazonite, we don't know where this comes from. I suspect it comes from the Ayer. The only known Amazonite quarry is over in Libya. Uh, I doubt they were going that far for this uh, rock. It's too abundant at the site. We found unworked, uh, you know, clumps of it and so on. Um, so now we come to the final period here. Uh, recorded at the site, we have pots. We have some pots with hearths, well dated to this time period. They're very thin, unpatterned. It was a transitory existence. We found no graves that date to this time period. And then you move into the monumental and historical periods, again mentioned uh, by Laura, people that probably are Berber origin that brought uh, camels into the area. We find their engravings, we find their tumuli, uh, but we don't find them buried at Govoro. This is what their ceramics look like, uh, typically painted but unornamented and quite distinctive from the ceramics that came before. This, in the Ayer, 100 miles, 150, 160 kilometers away in, as a direct shot, is a felsite quarry. So it turns out there's felsite coming. It's, a, it's, a, it's an igneous rock that comes to the surface. It's not, it's not a vitric, uh, you know, airborne rock. It's an igneous rock. has no no, no quartz in it. Comes to the surface. Here's a, a debitage from the site. We've got lots of tools from the site. There's four or five of these quarries. It, it, it's part of the Ayer on the eastern side of the Ayer. It's a feature. And they were using it, in, and they were also using lots of different kinds of, of petrified wood and quartzite. They were using it in the absence of obsidian. Uh, this was a pretty darn good material for large and small points. Um, there's been work on, this was found on the other side of the Ayer. There's been work on these, um, these artworks. Uh, Stefan mentioned also the, the, uh, not these uh, beautiful and earlier engraved works that were probably done by peoples like the Kiffian. He mentioned these round heads, which were probably done by people like the Tenorans. Um, you notice an artistic and cultural trajectory. Is it like Brooks suggested that this is an example of just cultural sort of complexity and, as it were, deterioration? Almost like a Minoan Mycenaean. These, these beautiful, beautiful, artistically, deeply engraved with leashes, depictions of natural history. And then you see this, which looks really elegant compared to what followed in the Berber scrawls of, of, you know, of camels and so on. Uh, I don't know. Uh, you know, it's just uh, these people at Gobro were probably living, this is the Bozos in, in a bend in the uh, Nirjur River in Mali probably living right near the water edge. We don't have evidence of their structures because there's no post holes or anything like that. They, they're just not preserved. We know they were, they were living there from the many of the things that we were left. I'm going to try to answer, and with uh, Elise Dutour is out in the audience there, a little bit, you know, any shred of evidence that would give us a time frame on the residencies of these people. Was it seasonal? Was it year round? Was, you know, certainly the children and all the artifacts and the evidence that they were living there is there, but were they semi-sedentary? Were they almost sedentary at times? So the otoliths found in the middens uh, supply some first shot. So with 12 of these, they come from a spread throughout the year. And so the first shot at that, we're going to hopefully do a little bit more, is that they were residents there. They were not fishing seasonally at one point during the year. Now, how this matches up with what we've heard earlier in the talk, uh, earlier in the seminar, um, onset, offset, <clears throat> I don't know why there's not a human record before about, uh, this is BP down here, this is BC, uh, BCE. This is uh, you know about 9,700. Uh, we've got some more dates. We've got one little fauna piece before that. Could be that there was too much water there. We uh, don't get ages back. Uh, it's not, doesn't seem to be preserved or it's modified lake beds back to that early time. Uh, it, it seems to occur a bit after when the lake was at a nice level, low. Maybe it was too wet. Uh, they persist clearly in good numbers uh, afterwards, <coughs> beyond 5,200 at Govoro. And quite frankly, 
we don't see much change as much as we can measure it. This is one of the best, richest, well-dated archaeological sites, and still it's poor to answer our questions. We, we have to admit that, the questions of why they started, what they were doing, but we don't notice a big shift towards, uh, towards uh, domesticated animals in the way of pastoralism. We don't see any kind of uh, shift. The people, as Stefan mentioned, died or moved on. We do see that in the period afterwards, there were people transiently coming through, but we don't see a big cultural shift as best as we can see it in the graves and in the middens that we have, have extensively studied and measured. It was a way of life that they were happy with. They saw cows. They didn't adopt them as best as we can tell as pastoralists. It wasn't a natural thing to do. People do things perhaps as long as they can when it works. And when it doesn't, and it really doesn't, and the climate has shifted on a decadal or greater time scale, they move on or die. Uh, that seems to be the best job, and I would love to have uh, lots of feedback on, on those conclusions. Uh, two main occupation phases uh, is what I've found. Fairly abrupt boundaries, distinctive populations. The skeletal biologist is, a, is, is very much a bet hedger, and so, Further analysis on further numbers of crania has him hedging his bets on a link to southern Europe. Uh, he's gone to, to measure the populations on the Iberian Peninsula and, and Italy. But we still have the association, not just in terms of skull form, but also in terms of cultural practices. The, uh, we've got uh, the, the oldest evidence of ground, of, of filed teeth, and we also have uh, uh, incisor ablation that matches some of the burials from the northern Algerian sites dating to 25,000 years ago. So there is a link to northern uh, coast of Africa, whether it goes beyond that or not, we don't really know. And the continuity, there could be continuity of the population to the second population. We see it culturally. So we see harpoons dated to the second period. It was our supposition that it was only the Aqualithic peoples, the Kiffian peoples that were using harpoons. It looks like they were being used by the second population as well. We see burial practices now. We've got several burials. They start out actually flexed and then seem to loosen up sometime in the middle of the second occupation period. So there's cultural things that extend across, including tooth ablation. But there clearly are, are, are differences, um, uh, noticeable differences in the second population. That first population took a big hit, no matter what happened to it. Um, this is, uh, I, you know, I collected things uh, in Niger, both large and small, both archaeological and paleontological. It is my hope uh, that we develop a new national museum in Niger uh, because there's so many things. They have Africa's um, humid period documented better than any other place. So it's my hope that we develop a museum in Niger uh, for this material when ultimately it will return, where, where it will return. Thank you very much.